Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. Today we'll start a new series of videos all about the statistics behind the behavior of large numbers of molecules, like we'd have in a typical sample we'd encounter in nature or in a lab experiment. We covered much of today's material in the Physical Chemistry 1 course, but we'll be using it in a different way in the next several videos. So, how can we determine what the distribution of velocities is? Well, to start with, let's think about what a distribution usually looks like. This question was investigated by the German mathematician Carl Gauss. He realized that the property that's randomly distributed around a mean can be described using this basic formula. When we plot this equation, we get what's usually called a bell-shaped curve. It's also called the Gaussian distribution in his honor. But the most common name for it is the normal distribution. This curve has a few properties that will be useful for us to know about. The first of these is the mean. Right now the curve has a mean of zero, but a real quantity such as the velocity may not have a mean of zero. In order to make the mean something else, we need to change the equation to this. The mean is x bar, so when we put in a value for x bar, the distribution shifts to the left or right. For example, here's what we'd get if we used 1 for the mean. Another property that we're interested in is the width of the distribution. That depends on the standard deviation of the values that we're measuring. Right now, the standard deviation is set to 1, but it could be larger or smaller than that. To take this into account, we need to change our equation so that it includes the standard deviation, which gives us this. So, if our data has a smaller standard deviation, such as 0.5, the equation would have 0.5 in the denominator of the exponent, and the curve would be this. The last property of a normal distribution is its amplitude. Right now, the height of this curve is 1, but we can make it higher or lower by altering the equation so that it has a constant out front. This is called the amplitude of the curve, and if we change it to 0.5, the height of the curve decreases to 0.5, like this. So, the three properties of a normal distribution are its mean, its standard deviation, and its amplitude. So, how do we use this to describe the velocity distribution of the molecules in a gas? Well, one person who was interested in the velocities of molecules was James Clerk Maxwell the same physicist who worked on the theory of electromagnetism. He guessed that the velocities of molecules would follow a normal distribution, so he wrote the equation this way. This gives the distribution of velocities in the x direction, and the function a is related to the standard deviation. For reasons we'll get to in a moment, the actual velocity distribution that he determined is more complicated than this, but we can still learn some interesting things from this distribution. For example, here's the velocity distribution for methane molecules at a variety of temperatures. Notice that at the highest temperature, the distribution has the greatest width. This makes sense because at higher temperatures, the molecules should be capable of moving at higher velocities, so there's a greater probability that the molecules will have high speeds in the positive or negative x directions. Meanwhile, as the temperature decreases, the distribution gets narrower, so the velocities tend to cluster closer to 0 meters per second. This too makes sense. As the temperature decreases, the molecules move more slowly. At a temperature of absolute zero, the molecules should all theoretically stop moving, so the distribution would simply be a vertical line at zero. Here's another series of plots. This time, all the plots were calculated for the same temperature, 300 Kelvin. Notice that the distribution is widest for the hydrogen and narrowest for carbon dioxide. This time, the factor that makes the difference is the mass of the molecules. Carbon dioxide is the heaviest molecule, so it moves the slowest, whereas hydrogen is the lightest molecule and therefore is able to reach higher velocities at the same temperature. So, what does all this tell us? For one thing, it means that the function a must involve both the temperature and the mass of the molecules, since both of those properties affect the width of the distribution. 
But unfortunately, there's also a feature of these curves that's not very realistic, and it's something that James Maxwell thought deeply about in order to understand how to make a more accurate equation for the velocity distribution. Notice that all the curves have their maxima at zero meters per second. In a way, that makes sense, because there should be just as many molecules moving in the positive x direction as in the negative x direction, so it's true that the average of those velocities would be zero. However, the molecules in a gas all move with a fairly high velocity in whatever direction they're headed. Almost none of them actually have a velocity of zero. That would mean that they're standing still, and molecules in a gas hardly ever do that at normal temperatures. However, these plots make it look like zero is the most likely velocity for a molecule. To solve this difficulty, Maxwell was able to use some simple but clever mathematics. Here's how. Let's think about what the y-axis of these plots means. This axis represents a relative probability that a molecule will have a velocity described on the x-axis. We can write that as an equation this way. The probability that a molecule will have a velocity vx is proportional to the exponential term we've been looking at. But why is the probability proportional to that term and not equal to it? The reason is that the probabilities for each velocity must add up to 1. If we use an equal sign, we're saying that the amplitude is equal to 1, which means that the height of the curve would be 1, but that can't be correct. Instead, we need to scale the curve by giving it an amplitude that we'll call capital A. The sum of all the probabilities for this distribution must be 1. And we can write that using this equation. This is equivalent to saying that the area under the curve described by the normal distribution must be equal to 1. There are a couple of things to notice about this integral. First, notice that the variable is vx, so that's what we're taking the integral with respect to. Also, the limits of the integral are equal to positive and negative infinity. That's because there's technically no limit to the possible velocities that the molecule could have, regardless of the temperature. In reality, the curve approaches zero pretty quickly, but it still never actually reaches zero. Also, remember that we put the amplitude a in the equation so that the area under the curve would be equal to 1. That's actually what makes this a normal distribution. The area under a normal distribution is always equal to 1. For that reason, this amplitude a is called the normalization constant. So, our task now is to try and figure out what exactly little a and capital A are equal to. We know that little a will depend on the temperature and the mass of the molecules, and capital A will be a constant. Once we know what they are, we'll have an equation that tells us exactly what the distribution of velocities is. To do it, we need to solve this integral. First, remember that the distribution is symmetric and is centered at zero. You might recall from your calculus course that this means that we can simplify the integral a little by making the limits 0 and infinity and doubling the result. Also, remember that capital A is a constant, so we're able to move that out of the integral. It turns out that this definite integral has a known solution. If you check a good table of integrals, you'll find out that the solution to the integral is this. If we plug that into the equation, the 2's cancel, and we find that 1 is equal to capital A times the square root of pi over little a. If we solve this for capital A, we find that big A is equal to the square root of little a over pi. Now we can plug that back into our equation for the probability, which gives us this. The purpose of doing all that was to reduce the number of unknowns in our probability equation from 2, capital A and little a, to just 1. Now we just need to find out what little a is equal to, and we'll have an equation for the velocity distribution. Before we move on, let's remember that this equation just describes the velocity distribution in the x direction. 
we'd really like to know what the overall velocity distribution is, not just the velocity along the x-axis. To get the probability for the overall velocity, we just need to multiply the probabilities along the x, y, and z axes. If we substitute the expressions for the probability for each of those directions, we get this. We can simplify this a bit by multiplying the three square root terms together, and also by combining the three exponential terms. Now this equation that we've arrived at is a perfectly correct equation for the velocity distribution. But it would be kind of difficult to use it the way that we've written it. That's because it's very challenging to measure the velocities in the x, y, and z directions separately. It would be much easier if we could just use v, the overall velocity, without having to worry about the directions. It turns out that we can do that, but in order to do it, we'll need to switch from Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates, and then integrate the resulting expression over the angles theta and phi. The reason we do that is because we don't really care at what angle the molecules are located relative to the origin of the coordinate system. When we perform the integral with respect to theta and phi, we'll eliminate those two variables from the equation. I'm actually going to skip those two steps, because changing the coordinate system from Cartesian to spherical is a fairly lengthy process. But when we do it, and the integration is finished, here's the equation we end up with. Notice that both sides of the equation include dv. We'll need to get rid of those, which means we need to take the integral with respect to v, the overall velocity. Here's the first equation we had for the kinetic energy. Aside from the velocity, it also has m in it, which is the mass of one molecule. It's not very easy to measure the mass of one molecule, but it is easy to look up the molecular mass on the periodic table. The molecular mass is given this symbol, a script m, and it's just equal to the mass of one molecule times Avogadro's number, which has the symbol Na. If we solve this equation for the mass of a molecule, we get this. We can substitute that into our expression for the kinetic energy, which gives us k equals n times one-half m over Na times the average square velocity. We can simplify this a little because n, the number of particles, divided by Avogadro's number, is equal to the moles. That gives us this equation. So the kinetic energy is equal to 1 half n times m times the average square velocity. And as we saw earlier, the kinetic energy is also equal to 3 halves nRT. We can set these two equations equal to each other, which gives us this. This is a pretty significant result. Everything in this equation is easy to measure except for v squared. That means if we solve the equation for v squared, we'll have a way to really easily calculate the velocity of the molecules in a gas. When we solve for the average v squared, here's what we get. The 2 and the n will both cancel out, which finally gives us this equation. The average v squared is just equal to 3rt over m, the molecular mass. As you can tell, this gives us a squared velocity. We're usually more interested in just a velocity, so we usually take the square root of this property. The result is called the root mean squared velocity, or RMS velocity. Let's try using this equation. Suppose we have a sample of hydrogen gas at 300 Kelvin. What will be the RMS velocity? To find out, we'll use this equation. R is 8.314 joules per Kelvin's moles, and the temperature is 300 K. What about the molecular mass? Remember, hydrogen gas is H2, not just H. So using the periodic table, we find that H2 weighs 2.01568 grams per mole. But wait, let's think about our units here for a moment. The units for R include joules. You might remember that joules are equal to kilograms times meter squared over second squared. Notice that the unit contains kilograms, not grams. So in order for our units to cancel out correctly, our mass should be in kilograms. 
So for the molecular mass, we have 0.00201568 kilograms per mole. That makes the term under the square root equal to 3.7122 times 10 to the sixth. As far as the units, the kelvins cancel out, and so do the kilograms and the moles. That leaves us with meters squared over seconds squared. Now we'll take the square root, which gives us 1,927 meters per second. That's really fast, almost two kilometers per second. That reminds us that the molecules in a gas are moving very rapidly. It turns out that if we have a function of x and we want to know the average value, we can get it using this formula. We get the average of f by just integrating f times the probability distribution. So if we want to know the average of the squared velocity, it'll be the integral of v squared times the probability distribution of v. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll continue this discussion to see how we can use what we've learned to account for the behavior of truly massive numbers of molecules. Remember, a typical sample will have something on the order of Avogadro's number of particles in it. That's truly an enormous number, so it requires some special treatment. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.